Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright. and This is a video teaching series, uh, Spirit-Led Soul Winning. This is lesson number eight. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to transition into some more, into some practical application of the principles that were taught in the first seven lessons. And uh, I believe that the things that were taught in the first seven lessons will become clearer to you, more easily understandable and relatable as we go through some of these examples. So the focus of this lesson and of the next several lessons that we will teach individual examples for it is this principle. The key to supernatural soul winning is being in the right place at the right time. The right place at the right time. You can be at the right place at the wrong time and nothing's going to happen. You can be at the uh, you can be at the wrong place at the right time and nothing's going to happen. So in order for there to be supernatural results through you as a conduit of God to use to see people born into the kingdom of God, you have to be led of the Spirit to be at the right time at the right place. A lot of times you don't even know that you're at the right time and the right place till the door opens. It may look like, looks like a wall to you, just a plain wall, but all of a sudden you're standing there at that wall and the door opens and you realize I'm at the right time and right place. I have experienced that a few times in my life at least, and I am very thankful to tell you it's one of the most thrilling things that you can ever experience and it's unforgettable. Uh, but this is this lesson is not about me, and neither will the next several lessons be about me and my personal testimonies. This is going to be taken from the Word of God so we can learn principles on this subject as we look at the Scripture. Uh, so again, the, the key to being used of God through being led by His Spirit is understanding that He will lead us so that we are at the right place at the right time. Uh, again, if only one of these is correct, we will miss the opportunity to bear fruit. Uh, and the re remainder of this lesson and the next several lessons, I'm going to look at in individual instances of this with God using different people uh, and show you how it works. And you will see that it is principle. It's not methodology. The Lord did not communicate with two people the same way. He led each person individually for that person, and we will get more into that as we look at each one of those. But I, And I'll be repeating this again. You don't learn the method. You learn the sensitivity because God won't use you the same way twice, in my opinion. Uh, it's my experience. He always changes it up a little bit so that you can't rely on methodology you have to rely on him. You have to rely on his spirit. Okay? So to begin with these examples of being in the right place at the right time, let's start with the number one example. And the number one person to be used in this example would be, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm reading to you from John chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Uh, and I, I'm just for time's sake, I didn't read the previous verses so we start with John 4, 4, speaking of Jesus. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, which uh, near the, to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied uh, with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which in Jewish time would be noon, middle of the day. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. And verse 8 has some explanation of circumstances for us. For he, his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. So the disciples were sent into the city of Sychar to buy meat. Jesus is sitting uh, on the curbing of this well, which was Jacob's well. And uh, this woman comes, this solitary person comes out of the town to draw water herself. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? 
for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So notice this, okay? Here's one method. Uh, Jesus is thirsty. He's been, they've been walking. He's sitting on the, on the well resting while his disciples go into the city to get bread. Uh, this woman, this Samaritan woman, comes out to the well to uh, draw water at noon. Custom was that the women of the town would go out to draw water in the mornings and the evenings because those were the two main meals of the day. Heavy meal to start the day, so you can have energy for the day, and a and a uh, heavy meal in the evening to replenish the uh, used up fuel of the energy uh, from the labor of the day. So the noonday meal was a fairly light meal, and so therefore uh, they only drew water in the mornings and evenings. But this woman was out here at noon. Well, Jesus just happened to be sitting on the curb of this well at noon. Okay. Uh, so this woman comes and the first thing he says to her is, uh, give me something to drink. Well, she wants to start an argument. Uh, what are you, a Jew asking drink of me, a Samaritan woman? You Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. What was Jesus' response to that? He didn't get into an argument with that. He didn't justify himself. He didn't explain himself. He didn't get. It. He got right to the meat of it. The Spirit of the Lord took him right to the meat of it. He answered, said unto her, "If you knew the gift of God, and who is it? Who it is that says to thee or to you, give me a drink? You would have asked of Him, and He would have given you living water." Now, let's go back to verse four a minute. Here it is. He must needs go through Samaria. Samaria. We're talking about being led by the Spirit of God to the right time and the right place. The Greek word here, must needs, it was a necessity as binding, according to Strong's. Complete Word Study Dictionary says it's needs, is necessary, has need of, is inevitable in the nature of things. The United Bible Society Translators uh, New Testament Handbook Series says, <coughs> uh, actually the geography of the country did not require that Jesus had to go through Samaria in order to get to Galilee from, uh, from Judea. In fact, the Jews usually walked around uh, Samaria to get from Galilee to Judea. The verb had to, tr uh, had, uh, had to translates the same verb that appears in John 3, 14, verses 14 and verse 30 where it denotes a divine necessity. The, the intimation is that it was God's will or purpose that Jesus should pass through Samaria. He had a divine appointment. That's why we say expanded translation of the New Testament translates verse 4 this way. Now, it was necessary in the nature of the case for him to be going through Samaria. It was necessary. According to whom? According to whom was it necessary? According to God. And God led Christ, the Son of God, to not go around Samaria as was the custom of the Jews because they had no dealings with the Samaritans. They wouldn't even walk through their, their territory even though it was a shorter trip. They'd take the longer way so that they could stay separated from the Samaritans. Now, I don't want to go into all of that. There's a, a reasons for all the explanations. That doesn't... Whatever. But the point is, Jesus had a divine appointment. He had a divine appointment in Samaria, a place that was not normal for a Jew to travel through. And he's talking to a Samaritan woman. And we find out as the conversation continues exactly what was going on. She still won't argue. She said, where are you going to get this water from to give me to drink? You don't have anything to draw with, and this well is deep. And Jesus said, whoever drinks of this well, 
of this water. He's going to thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. It, it shall be in him a well of water springing up to unto everlasting life. Now, <laughs> what was he talking about? As I said in an earlier lesson, he's talking about her emptiness. She wanted to fuss about politics. She wanted to talk about race. She wanted to talk about prejudice. She wanted to talk about offense. She wanted to talk about uh, whatever. And she wanted to debate religion. We find that out as uh, the story goes on. I'm not going to read all that in this lesson. If you read it for yourself, you'll find out she still wants to debate. You know, she's talking about our fathers worshiping this mountain. You know, you know, here and Jesus had to talk to her about true worshipers versus false worshipers. But this is the point. He dealt with her emptiness, and he told her there was hope. And he told her he was the source of the water that would quench the thirst of her in, in, inside, of her emptiness. That was, that was what he did. Where did all that come from? It came to him by the Spirit. Now, the Lord has used me to win people, uh, to witness to people that were both drug addicts and alcoholics. I, I've never used any drugs knowingly in my life except for uh, Demerol before surgery. They give you stuff for calm you down in surgery, I guess. Uh, I, I'm allergic to opiate-based pain medication. And so uh, I've never had any of that. And, and I've never used any, any kind of recreational drugs. Uh, med medicine, I rarely use anything more than aspirin or Tylenol or a Advil or something like that. So I've never used any of that. So, and I also never drank any alcohol. Now, how in the world can somebody who's never experienced those things witness to somebody that has? And they can say, well, you never experienced, you don't know what you're talking about. No, but I have experienced the very reason you do those things. Because your problem is not alcohol, it's not drugs, it's not whatever. Your problem's that emptiness inside, and I've had it. And I've been able to use that approach as the Lord has led me to. And I've never covered the story the same way twice. I've never, in the sense of details and how it's been approached, Everything I've said was true. I just never told all the details. And, and different times of witnessing different people, I'd feel led. It just would there. I'd be listening and repeating and just saying what's coming to me. And I'm, I end up, I was saying exactly the things they needed to hear so that they could receive. So I didn't try to repeat my story because I've learned my story. I've learned my story. I had to repeat my story. No, I, I let him do that. And uh, it was an impact. Now, the Lord will supernaturally confirm your testimony. You say, well, how? Signs, wonders, miracles, bolts from heaven? No. Jesus, Jesus' words to her were confirmed because the Lord, he had knowledge of the woman. The Spirit of God gave him knowledge of this woman's life. And he spoke to her things he could not have known, and she testified to this later. This is, here's a man who told me everything about me. Uh, is not this the Christ that would know all things? And so the point being in this situation is, not only did the Spirit of God compel the man Christ Jesus to travel a path that his disciples were not comfortable with and that his Jewish heritage was not comfortable with because the Spirit of, the God, the, Spirit of the Lord compelled him to because it was necessary. There was a divine appointment there. It was the divine appointment. Now, the Lord didn't confirm to him supernaturally this was going on by giving him knowledge. And notice how gently he approached the knowledge he was given. He didn't say, you living with a man. You've been married, divorced five times. No. He just simply says, uh, 
Where's your husband? Oh, I don't have a husband. And he says to her, you told the truth. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, that just about wiped all her contentiousness away because she knows she's not talking to an, a man here. She's talking to someone that's speaking to her from God's perspective. I've had this happen so many times where I'm just talking to someone and hear it repeating, and I can't even believe the stuff's coming out of my mouth. And yet, come to find out, it was exactly what they needed to, to hear, and I was telling them stuff I could not have known about. Now, sometimes that was directly. Sometimes it wasn't directly at all. It was very indirect. But they knew I was talking to them and that I could not have known what I was saying. And there have been times I've actually said to a person, now, we both know there's no way I could have known those things about you I've just said. We both know that. I don't know you. I don't know these things about you. You don't know me. There's no way for me to know this. So the same person that's telling me this so that I can tell you, so you can know that he's talking to me for you, I can then say to you, uh, he loves you and he wants to help you and you don't have to live like this. God can change your life. Now, there is no rote method and speech you make in witnessing. Now, years ago, when I first came to town, and I'll tell you about this uh, in more detail another way, I'd knock on doors and being a very introverted person and that that having to die inside just to even get out of the car and knock on a door of where, where I didn't know the people. Uh, it was very difficult, and sometimes even when I did know the people. So the Lord would give me something to say, and this is what I used uh, in the beginning and some form of it now. Uh, they would open the door and say, hello, I'm uh, Pastor Chester Wright. I'm with the uh, Antioch Church here in town, and just w I just want to stop by and, and give you an invitation to uh, come to our services. I don't let them respond. I start a conversation that I can direct as the Lord get, leads me to direct it by asking a question. Have you ever been in a Pentecostal service before? Now, if they respond, no, yeah, whatever, I know the Holy Ghost is going to go in different directions with that. If they say I'm not interested and they close the door, how do you respond to somebody closing the door to your face? Thank you, Father for not letting me waste my time here with someone that's not hungry so that you can lead me to the ones that are hungry. If you can't handle that, you're not going to be a soul winner. If you can't handle rejection without, so that you can know that people are not rejecting you, they're rejecting him. They're rejecting the word. If you're going to take all of that personal, you are never going to be a soul winner. Never going to be a soul winner. Because you're making it about you, not about him. You can't win, you know, the, the, the saying is, well, you got to win people to yourself before you win them to God. I, I'd like to see book, chapter, and verse for that because I've looked. I'd like to see anywhere in the book where the scripture says we're supposed to win people to ourselves before we win them to God. So we, we go to all this effort to make this church uh, so appealing to the sinners so we can win them to us before we win them to God. Really? I'd like to see how many times in the book that was the methodology used. No. Paul said, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. So how am I going to win people to me so that uh, I can win them to him? No. No. It's not about me. It's not about them liking me or agreeing with me or, or uh, uh, wanting to become my friend. It's about him. And he's got to stay first and foremost because people will come to your church because they like you, because we're nice people. And we've got great singing, whatever, and the preaching's great and all that stuff. People will come because of that. 
they, if they have any faith in God, they'll become call, uh, because of all of that. Till you call them to come to Jesus and they begin to understand the price. Now they're gone. Or you compromise to keep them because you don't want to lose them. Really? Really? Is that soul winning? That's growing a church, but it's not soul winning. That's growing a church. Boy, you can grow in that crowd. You can get in that church. Boy, yes, sir, we're growing a church. We're not winning anybody. We're not winning anybody. They're not becoming children of God. They're becoming converts to our doctrine, becoming members, uh, uh, attendees and members of our congregation, and they don't know Jesus, and they're, and they're not going to be saved. They're not. I'm not trying to be harsh here. But the, it's the fault is not theirs, it's yours. It's mine. If I'm trying to win them to me, it defaults on me. I had a guy tell me one time, I expect everybody to like me. Well, then he just put, he just told us what side of the fence he was on because Jesus said, uh, uh, beware when all men speak well of you. Beware. If you're seeking the approval of men, you can't have the approval of God. That's book. So we're not trying to offend people. But at the same time, we're not trying to win them to ourselves. The Word of God saves. The Spirit of God gives life. The Spirit and the Word draws people to Jesus, not to us, not to our assembly, not to our nice people that we are, not to our great singing and our great preaching. So if you want to do all that, fine. You don't need these video series. But if you want to see people saved and their lives changed, and you want to be a vessel that God can use, then you, you've got to accept these things. The priority is him. Don't forget when he first said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. He wasn't talking about being praised. He was talking about being crucified. And there is a reason why the Greek word translated witness is actually the word from which we get the English word martyr. Because if I'm going to be a fruitful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I got to die to me. It can't be about me. And I got to be willing for my life to be put on the line. For me, with my personality, I'm sitting here in a, in a room with nothing but a camera. I'm in a video studio recording this, and there's no people in this room. Why? Because that's pretty comfortable for my personality because I'm an introvert. Not when the anointing is flowing, but when it's lifted, I'm an introvert. It's not easy for me to meet people anywhere. In the church, out of the church, doesn't make any difference. It's not easy for me to meet people. So to just deal with people, I got to die. I got to die to my personality. I, I, my wife is shocked that I can sit for hours, days in the house and read and whatever and study and and never even talk to people. I'm very comfortable with that. I don't hate people. I don't. I love people, and I got very good friends. I love my wife. I love my family. But my personality is I'm very comfortable being alone. I don't need to be with people to be happy. I have Jesus. I have my Bible. Uh, and I can be happy right there. That's it, whatever. And I, I don't want to go to jail be by myself, but if I had to go to jail, uh, if I could just have my Bible, something to write on, <laughs> I, I can make it. By the grace of God, I can make it. Now, to be, a, to be involved with people, to be a conduit, that has to die in me. It has to die. I have to die to myself. I have to die. Now, Jesus had a divine appointment in Samaria. Now, is it possible that the reason he was there at noon and she was there at noon is because she'd been married five times and was now living just living with a man that wasn't her husband? Is it possible she was a social outcast it's when all the women of the community came out in the e mornings and the evenings to draw water. She didn't come then. Now, the disciples were sent by Jesus into town to get some food. They come back with food. They see him talking to this woman. He said, Master, eat. And he said, I, 
I don't need your food. I got meat to eat that you know not of. What is that demonstrating? That he knew that if they were there and this woman showed up, she'd be intimidated. And that he would not have the scenario in which he could talk to her. He wouldn't be able to do it. So he sent them away, not because he was hungry. They got food they wanted to eat. They were all tired from walking. But he was energized by his opportunity to be used by the Spirit of the Lord to witness to this woman. He was energized by it. The disciples wondered among themselves, what was he doing talking to this woman? He had a divine appointment. He was in the right place at the right time. And when he sent her back into the city, they all came out to greet him because her witness convinced an entire group of people. Now, if a good person had been at that well in the morning with a group and she went and said, oh, I met this guy. He's, uh, he's wonderful. Uh, but they're going to go, what? Now, the Lord is able to use all time, all kinds, because he has a right time and a right place with the right soul for each one of us. Through whatever method he has, through whatever way he wants to approach that, he can do that. He knows the right person to talk to this person. And he knows the right time because if it's a certain time, things are going too well for them. They're not open. They're not hungry. But at other times, they're very broken. And if I'm trying to talk to them when they're not hungry and not broken, I'm not going to have the same uh, impact that I will if I'm talking to them when they're broken and hungry. So there's a right time and a right place with every soul. And I can't sit and figure that out. You can't figure that out. You can't learn a method because God is the only one that knows the the heart of the individual that he's wanting to talk to and use you or I to do it. And he's the only one that knows not only who they are, what they need to hear, and when they need to hear it. And so therefore, if I'm going to be used of God to see people saved, that whole city came out to greet him. Because of her testimony, he knew how to do that. The demoniac of Gadara, the Gadareans, they they weren't interested in him. But a man who had been filled with a, a legion of demons that were cast out, all of a sudden, they when he witnesses to them, there's an impact there. So... The the moral of this story is, or the summary of this story is, don't judge who God sends you to talk to by where they are now and what they look like now. You don't know how he's able to use them. That's why we need to go by the Spirit's leading to the right place at the right time, and he'll show us the right person to talk to, and then he'll give us the words to say that will be words of eternal life for them. This is the first of several uh, examples I'm going to use. I'm going to do a lesson on each one of those examples, the next several, just so you'd see different perspectives and different methods that the Lord used with people other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to say, well, Christ here, he's the one, you know, he can do this, but we can't. Really? Uh, How about John 14, 12 again? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. We are just as capable of being able to know about this woman and her past as Jesus was. We have the same Holy Ghost that was in the man Christ Jesus. We have the same ability to be led by him if we will allow it. We have the same ability for him to give us the words to say, words of eternal life to a person. We just have to get past the fact that we may miss it, first of all, and second of all, that some will reject it. Even if we're in the right place at the right time, some will reject it. 
it's God's, he's the Savior, we are not. We're only the conduit. He's the Savior, we are not. We have an opportunity, though, as fellow laborers with him in his harvest field to see hundreds, thousands of people saved. I, 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 I'm really restraining myself to not get in some te- personal testimonies that I'm going to focus on later, just so you can see. But it's a wonderful, awesome thing when God leads you to a Cornelius that you didn't know was a Cornelius. And that person becomes used of God to see hundreds and thousands of saved them, people saved themselves. Amen. I pray that so far in this video series you have been blessed and helped and that you've been inspired by the Holy Ghost to be able to to cause you to want to be able to study the Word of God and to be able to pray and to learn to walk in the Spirit so you can be used of God. It takes both. It's not enough to know the Word of God. It's not enough, enough to be sensitive to the Spirit. I need to know the Word of God and I need to be sensitive to the Spirit so the two can work together in me and through me to get me and you to the right place at the right time, talk to the right person with the right words so they have a chance to be saved. God bless you. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll receive the spirit of grace to be able to enable you to to hunger and thirst for Jesus and to be a part of him yoked up together with him in his yoke so that we can work together with him to see souls saved. God bless you in Jesus' name.